Welcome to the ultimate Commodore 1541 disk drive talk here at the Vintage Computer Festival West 2021. My name is Michael Style. You may know me from my presentations like the ultimate talks about the C64, the Game Boy, and the Apollo guidance computer, or from my blog at pagetable.com. This talk is about the Commodore 1541, the floppy drive for the C64, as well as 500 quarter inch floppy disks. First, we'll talk about the history of the 500 quarter inch format and the 1541 drive. Then we'll discuss how data is represented on a disk and how the data gets from the drive to the computer. The second part is about creative uses, about software that speeds up data access, stores data in a different format, or presents the disk, uh, prevents the disk from being copied. And finally, we'll talk about how to preserve your old disks using, using modern tools. Let's start with the history of the Commodore 1541. In the late 70s and the 80s, floppy disks were the compromise between cheap, slow tapes and the more expensive, faster hard drives. The original floppy disk was IBM's 8-inch disk, introduced in 1972 as the IBM 3740. Alan Sugar, the co-inventor of the 8-inch technology, developed the more compact and cheaper 5 and a quarter inch format, the mini floppy, and a drive to go with it in 1976 with his own company, Sugar Associates. The best-known floppy disk is the 3.5-inch disk, format by Sony, the microfloppy. The sugared mini floppy promised access times and data transfer rates comparable to the 8-inch disk, but at about half the price and requiring much less space. And the timing fit well with the home computer revolution of the late 70s. The drive for this format is the sugared SA400. It is quite massive, weighing one and a half kilograms. Um, the board on top of the drive mechanism is the controller, which wrote the disk in a format similar to 8-inch disks, um, at about 80 kilobytes per disk side. After releasing the Apple II in 1977, Apple wanted to offer a floppy drive to go with the computer. Steve Wozniak liked the sugared drive, but had no interest in the built-in controller board. There already was a CPU in the Apple II, and it would be able to do the job of the controller just as well. Sugar agreed to send Apple 10 demo drives without controllers, but they intentionally sent defective units, hoping Apple would give up and buy the controller version after all. But was repaired the drives, and Apple ended up ordering the SA400 without Sugar's controller. Sugar finally offered the mechanism alone as the SA390. Commodore wasn't interested in the comp controller either. They had just bought the chip maker Moss, so they could build a cheaper, a cheaper controller themselves, basing it on a 6502 CPU. The Commodore drive was quite a powerful device. It had two drive mechanisms, a controller with two CPUs, which was also responsible for the file system, and an industry standard IEEE 488 connector, which even allowed a single drive to be shared by several PET computers. Let's take a closer look at the Commodore's first drive, the 2040 from 1978. If we open the case, we can see the mechanism of one drive on the right. The other drive's mechanism is covered by the Commodore designed analog board. And on the top, upside down, is the digital board with two CPUs, one for the drives and one for file system and communication with the PET. And here in the back is the IEEE 488 connector. In the following years, Commodore introduced drives like the 8250 with a higher capacity and the ability to access both disk sides um, without flipping the disk, but also cheaper single drive units. This is the first low-cost drive, the 2031 from 1980. The controller was greatly simplified and now had only one CPU. And the mechanism is still the SA390. From 1981 on, manufacturers like Alps made half-height mechanics, uh, which allowed Commodore to make low-profile drives like the 2031 LP. The controller was still the same. The well-known 1541 from the year 1982, the drive to go together with a C64, is almost identical to the 2031 LP. The only difference is the new serial bus of the VIC-20 and C64 instead of the IEEE bus of the PET. The 1541-2 from 1988 used even more compact mechanics from different manufacturers, and the board was once again cost-reduced. In the 1980s, there was a booming market for sugared compatible mechanisms. Next to sugared, Commodore used drives from Micropolis, Tandon, and MPI in the high-end devices for the PET, and mechanisms from Matsushita, Alps, Mitsumi, aka Neutronics, Chinon, JPN, and Saffronic in the later low-cost devices like the 1541. For size comparison, some family photos. High-profile drives are half as wide as dual drives, and low-profile drives half as high as high-profile. And the 1541-2 is again smaller than low profile and is also less long. Let's move on to the format in which data is stored on a 1541 disk. 
And this is the 500 inch, 5 and a quarter inch mini floppy. Except for the reinforcing ring, the back looks like the front. There's a right protect notch. Um, if the, the notch is there, this can be written to. This disc has a notch on both sides because with a 1541 you can flip the disc over and use the other side. The inside of the PVC jacket is lined with anti-static fabric to trap dust and prevent abrasion. The media itself is thin bowpad foil coated with iron oxide. Apart from the center, the jacket has two more cutouts. One is for the index hole. Some drives use this hole to have a defined beginning for the circular tracks. Commodore drives don't use it. The overhaul gives the read right hand access to the media. The data is stored in concentric tracks. Standard floppy disks are specified at 48 TPI, that's 48 tracks per inch. The outermost track is track one, and the innermost is track 40. The disk spins at five revolutions per second, and the head can reach the different tracks by moving up and down over the cutout. The part about the 40 tracks is not entirely correct. The first SA400 and the SA390 from 1976 were only designed for 35 tracks, and the first floppy disks even had a smaller cutout for the head. The Commodore 2040 therefore only used 35 tracks, and its successors, including the 1541, inherited this format. All variants of the mechanism of the 1541 can reach all 40 tracks, though. Now let's, look, let's look at the single track. From the head's point of view, the track is like a linear magnetic tape that repeats itself. The outermost track has a length of about 42 centimeters, but towards the inside, the tracks become shorter and shorter. Track 40 is only about 20 centimeters long. That's a total of 12 meters, by the way. From the head's point of view, though, there is no linear length. No matter which track the head is on, each track is always 200 milliseconds long, a fifth of a second, which corresponds to one complete revolution of the disk. But it's important to note that we cannot write the data on the inner tracks with the same density as on the outer tracks. After all, these tracks are shorter. That's why Commodore drives divide disks into four density zones. The outermost zone is zone three, followed by two, one, and zone zero on the inside. It is the outermost, uh, in the outermost zone from track one to 17, data is recorded at the maximum density. In the zone from track 18 to 24, the density is slightly lower. In tracks 25 to 30, the spacing between the zeros and ones is, is again somewhat wider. And from th track 30, the density is the lowest. So in the different zones, the timing for reading and writing bits is different. In the fastest zone, the, a bit is written every 3.25 uh, microseconds and the slowest every four microseconds. So depending on the zone, this then results in a gross capacity of just over six to just under eight kilobytes per track. In total, that would be about 250 kilobytes gross. Each track is now divided into several sectors, and tracks of the different density zones have a different number of sectors. This is a visualization of a disk side. The double red lines in this picture delimit the sectors. We can clearly see the four zones. This white line illustrates how sectors in the inner tracks would be narrow if it weren't for the lower recording speed. That's why the tracks in the different zones fit a different number of sectors. In zone three, these are sectors zero, one, two, and so on up to 19 and 20. In zone two, these are zero, uh, sectors zero through 18. In zone one, zero to 17, and zone zero, zero to 16. The zeros on ones are stored on disk by magnetizing the iron oxide. A logical one corresponds to a high frequency alternation of the north and south pole. Um, and a logical zero is represented by constant magnetization. But there is a physical limit to all this. The me mechanism can only detect up to two zero bits in a row. If there are more bits, it can no longer reliably count them. Commodore uses a four bit to five bit conversion to satisfy this constraint. The codes on the right never have more than two zeros in a row and never more than one zero at the beginning or the end, which is required when concatenating these codes. This encoding is called grouped code recording, or GCR, and has previously been used for data storage on tapes. It reduces the usable data by 20%, so the disk's 250 kilobytes become 200 kilobytes. A side effect of GCR is that the encoding never produces more than eight one bits in a row. This can be used to solve another problem. If we insert a disk into the drive and start reading data, we can't decide where one of these encoded five tuples starts when reading GCR code. Depending on where we start decoding, we would get different data. A sync signal is 10 or more one bits in a row. In the normal GCR code, these cannot occur. Such a sync signal now indicates which position we can start, uh, which position we can start decoding. We don't need this for every GCR tuple. Once per sector is enough. Now let's see how sectors are stored on a track using GCR encoding and the sync signal. The mechanism requires a sync to be at least 10 one bits long, but the Commodore disk format specifies it to be 40 bits for added safety. 
the sector header is stored after the sync. It always starts with a magic constant of eight and contains the current track and which sector is stored next. The disk ID is two 8-bit values stored in each sector header when the disk is formatted. It should be unique per disk, so it can help the firmware detect a disk change. The checksum is the XOR of track, sector, and ID. The header data is stored GCR encoded, so to make the amount of GCR bits divisible by eight, it is padded by two more bytes. And after that comes a gap of nine bytes. We'll see later what these are needed for. And after the header, we have another sync marker. The data behind it is the 256 payload data bytes of the sector prefixed with a constant of seven to distinguish the header from the sector data. Again, there's a checksum and two bytes of padding. After the sector data, there's another gap of seven bytes followed, followed by the next sector header. Now let's see how a sector is found and read. Let's assume the head is in the middle of a sector of any, uh, uh, of the sector data of any sector on track one. The disk is spinning, we wait for the sync signal. We now decode the data behind it. The magic eight indicates that this is a sector header. Otherwise we would have to wait for the next sync. After decoding, it becomes clear that we're on track one and the next sector is number zero. If this was the wrong track, we would move the head by the correct number of steps depending on the current track and the target track. Uh, that's because the mechanism usually does not know the absolute position of the head and must rely on the data on disk um, to tell it. If the next sector is not the desired one, we keep reading sector headers until the correct was found. Once it's found, we then wait for the next sync and read the data behind it into a buffer and apply the GCM, GCR transfer form to get the original data. Now let's look at writing. Here we also have to wait for the sync signal. And if we found a header, it is read and decoded. As with reading, we search for the correct track and the sector. If we have found the right sector, the mechanism must be switched to writing. The firmware makes sure to wait the correct amount of time to skip the gap. Then it writes a sync and the GCR encoded new data of the sector. Here we can see what the two gaps are needed for. The gap after the header is necessary to give the firmware time to decode and compare the header and to switch the mechanism to writing. And the gap after the data is necessary so that if the motor is set slightly too fast, the drive overwrites the gap with the last bytes of the sector instead of overwriting the next sync signal or even the next header. So let's say we just read sector zero. The drive's memory now contains the sector data, which is still GCR encoded. It has to be decoded and then transferred over the serial bus to the C64. In the meantime, the motor keeps running and the head ends up being over one of the later sectors. Reading sector one next would mean having to wait almost one full turn. Ideally, would, we would now read sector seven. So, the so in this example, the sector interleave would be seven. In practice, the interleave is usually determined experimentally based on the GCR and tr transmission code used. So a disk has 35 tracks, and on the lowest level, these tracks are divided into a different number of sectors, depending on the density zone. This makes a total of 683 sectors, or blocks of 256 bytes each, just over 170 kilobytes. The level above this is the Commodore file system, which is managed by the drive's firmware. All of track 18 is reserved for management structures. The track in the center was picked in order to minimize the distances between this track and all other tracks. This leaves 664 bytes, 664 blocks for files. If a file is written to an empty disk, the first blocks are written to track 17, again, to, min to minimize head movements. The first block is stored in 17.0. The default interleaf on the 1541 is 10, so the second block is 10 sectors further on. That is 17.10. The third block will be on sector 20, the fourth one on 20 plus 10 equals 30, modulo 21 equals nine, and so on. How blocks are linked is stored in the first two bytes of each block. Here, this block points to track 17, sector 10, hex 110A. The remaining 254 bytes in the block are the actual user data. In the reference sector in this example, the link bytes are 1114, which again point to the next block. In this block, the link bytes say 0063. Zero is not a valid track number, so this indicates that this is the last block in the chain. The second byte indicates how many bytes in this block are valid and belong to the file. In this case, the byte at offset 6.3 is the last. The disk's directory points to these lists of blocks. Directory entries are stored in a concatenated list of blocks on track 18. The first block for this is sector 1, and like file blocks, directory blocks have two linked bytes at the start. Each file has a 32-byte entry with a name of up to 16 ASCII characters, a file type, a length in blocks, and a pointer to the track and sector of the first block. Sector zero on track 18 contains global information about the file system. It starts with a link to sector one, 
Um, the first block with file entries. This is the ASCII name of the file system with a maximum of 16 characters. The disk ID is that serial number that is also contained in each sector header. The copy here is purely cosmetic and never actually evaluated. Same goes with the 2A, which denotes the format of the file system. The second character of the file system version, though, the letter A, is also stored at offset 2. If the value here is different, the 1541 refuses to make changes to the file system. And these 35 entries with four bytes each are the BAM, the block availability map. For each sector of each track, there's one bit indicating whether the block is free or occupied. The number of free blocks can be calculated quite easily from this table. Now let's have a look at the disk drive hardware. The disk is inserted with a cutout facing the drive. There would normally be a lever on this bar that pushes the opposite side of the motor onto the centering of the disk. This centers the disk and allows the motor to turn it. The board on the left contains a photodiode to detect if the head has a right protect notch. If the right protect is on, the hardware actually prevents the head from switching to writing. This ceramic square is the read-write head. It is the bottom surface of the inserted disk that is read from or written to. This black part has some foam on it that pushes against the disk from the other side. The stepper motor moves the head back and forth. These are the electronics of the 1541-2. They consist of a 6502 CPU with one megahertz of RAM, uh, with one megahertz RAM and ROM chips, two VIO controllers, one for the mechanism and one for communicating with the C64, and a gate array for the rest of the logic. The mechanism is, uh, con is connected to this header, and either of the two tin DIN ports connects the 1541 to the C64. The 64 kilobytes address space of the 6502 is mostly empty. The 1541 only has two kilobytes of RAM, but 16 kilobytes of ROM, which not only contain the low-level code for reading and writing sectors and formatting disks, but also the file system driver and the library co for communicating with the C64. The two I.O. chips are also mapped into memory. The second VR controller takes care of the mechanism. The hardware automatically collects bits read from the head into bytes and makes them available on port A. Whole bytes can also be written to port A, which are then transferred bit by bit to the medium at the set speed. The CB2 register of the VR uh, switches the head between read and write mode. The read flag in the CPU indicates whether a byte is ready at port A or whether port A is ready to receive another byte. The 6502 CPU has a set overflow, SOPEN, that allows external hardware to directly set the overflow flag in the status register. With only one BVC instruction, branch overflow clear, we can build a very tight loop to wait for a byte or for, um, for uh, or a byte to be written. Port B controls the remaining features of the mechanism. Bit 7 indicates whether a sync signal has just been detected by the hardware. Bit 5 and 6 select the recording density. Bit 4 indicates if the disk is write protected. Bit 3 controls the activity LED. Bit 2 turns the motor on or off. And the lower two bits move the head by writing either ascending or descending combinations of bits. It does not make, uh, take much code to control the mechanism. To wait for a sync signal, all we have to do is read address 1C00 until the top bit is zero. The bit instruction of the 6502 CPU reads, among other things, the top bit of the specified memory address into the negative flag and BMI um, branches if the, if the negative flag is one. And as we just saw, we can wait for a byte to be read from the head by just using this BVC instruction, which waits in place until the V flag is set by the hardware. After that, we have to use CLV to clear the V flag again. The byte from the read head is now available at address 1C01, so this LDA instruction will load it into the A register. Depending on the density zone, the new, a new byte arrives every 26 to 32 CPU clocks. So if the polling loop is slower or the CPU is interrupted, we may miss bytes. There's nothing too special about formatting a disk. It just fills the whole disk with sector headers and empty sector data. This is the code of a, sample, of a simple formatting routine for one track. For each sector, a sync mark is written, which is five times the constant FF, so 41 bits. Then the GCR encoded sector header with the correctly filled track and sector numbers. And then the co constant hex 55 as gap bytes. Then again, a sync mark, 256 GCR coded zeros for the empty sector content, and then a gap with the hex 55 constant. If this were all we do, there would remain a gap at the end of each track, the tail gap, which would not be overwritten. There can still be sync markers and headers from old content in there. Therefore, the code writes 512 padding bytes at the beginning of each track to guarantee to fill this gap as well. A better but slightly slower way to ensure this um, uh, is to measure uh, the capacity of the track first and pick a size for the gap between the sectors to distribute the sectors evenly across the track.
In order to understand the software architecture of the 1541 ROM, one must first look at the architecture of the first Commodore drive, the 2040, which still had two CPUs, the disk controller with very little RAM and ROM and I.O. access to the mechanism, and the bus controller with a little RAM and a lot of ROM and I.O. access to the bus. Another four kilobytes of RAM was shared between the two CPUs. The RAM contains 15 buffers of 256 bytes each, each of which can temporarily st store one sector. All reads, read and write operations of sectors pass through these buffers. RAM also contains a shared table which is used by the bus controller to send commands to the disk controller. To do this, it fills in track and sector numbers as well as a code for read, write, compare, track, search, and so on. When the operation is complete, the disk controller overwrites the command with a status code. The low-cost drives like the 2031 and the 1541, the total memory was reduced to two kilobytes. Um, so there are only five buffers. Also, there are only a single CPU. It switches 50 times per second between the two personalities, disk controller and bus controller. There's no particularly good reason for this architecture, except perhaps that rewriting the ROM code for a single, single, CPU, single CPU was presumably easier this way. So the communication model between the two personalities is still the same on the 1541. For example, to read a sector, the bus controller first reads the track and the sector into the job table in the zero page. Here it is buffer zero, which is a memory starting at hex 0300. To start the job, we write the job code, hex 80, which means read. The interrupt handler will switch the CPU into the disk personality and execute the command after 20 milliseconds at the, at the latest. We wait by reading the memory cell of the job code until the top bit has been cleared, that is, the command has been overwritten with the status code. Then we can evaluate the status code. And if everything is okay, we can access the data starting from hex 0300. Now that we have seen how the 1541 copies data between the disk and its own memory, let's talk about the transmission of this data from the drive to the computer. All computers from the Commodore 8-bit series, the PET, the VIC-20, C64, Plus 4, C128, and the unreleased C65, as well as their drives, speak a family of protocols for data transfer. The ancestor of this family is the IEEE 488 bus used by the PET. Data is sent parallel through a 24-pin Centronics connector. Above the byte transfer layer is the IEEE bus arbitration layer, and above that, the proprietary Commodore DOS protocol for working with files. For the 1981 VIC-20, Commodore developed a cost-reduced version with serial instead of parallel data transfer. The layers uh, 3 and 4 remained the same. There were two faster protocols over the same cable, Commodore's own fast serial, used by the C128 and later describes, as well as Jiffy DOS from a third party, which required replacing the ROMs of the computer and the drive. And for completeness, for the plus four, Commodore switched to a different parallel protocol, and the C65 integrated the drive directly into the computer. Now let's look at the layers of the serial protocol stack one by one. Commodore serial devices can be daisy-chained. Most devices have two serial ports, one to connect to the previous device and one for the next device. Commodore serial uses a six-pin DIN connector. For data transmission, there's a clock line and a data line. The ATN line, which stands for attention, is used for bus arbitration. The reset line allows the computer to reset all devices. This pin is not wired on either the C64 or the 1541. It is, it is used by the C128 fast serial protocol. And this is the ground wire. Now let's look at how data is transmitted over this cable. That is layer two of the protocol stack. All data lines on the bus are open collector. The line will be one if one or more nodes pull the line to one. It is only zero if all nodes release the line. In other words, if the line is zero, we know that all nodes have set the line to zero, but if the line is one, we only know that at least one has set the line to one, but we don't know which one. With two wires, we can then build a protocol where bytes are transmitted from one sender to any number of receivers. The protocol starts with a sender holding the clock line and all receivers holding the data line. As soon as the sender has data to send, it releases the clock line. It's, this signals data is available. Once the receivers are done with whatever tasks they had to do, they release the data line in order to signal, I would be ready to receive a byte. Here, receiver A lets go of the line first, but since receiver B is still holding it, the value of data is unchanged. Only when the second receiver is also ready and releases data, the line changes to logical zero. All receivers are now ready, so from now on, both clock and data are controlled by the sender. The sender can see that all the receivers are ready and pulls the clock line to one. It means for the receivers, the bit in the data line is not yet valid. Then the sender writes the first data bit, bit zero of the byte into the data line. In this example, it's one. Clock is still held, so the value is still not valid. 
now the sender releases the clock line and holds the state for at least 60 microseconds. The receiver must reach a value of data during this time window. Next, the sender pulls the clock line again to signal that the bit is no longer valid and also clears the bit from the data line. This state is also hold, held for 60 microseconds. Now the next bit is placed on data, but it's not yet valid. Clock is released for 60 microseconds. The bit is valid. Clock is pulled. The bit is no longer valid. And the next bit, until all eight bit are, bits are transferred. Each bit is always held for 60 microseconds with clock released. And then the next bit is prepared for 60 microseconds. After the last bit, the sender releases the data line as always. Now the data line belongs to the receivers again. These now pull the data line to get into the base state, first one, then the other. As soon as the sender has more data, the protocol can start again from the beginning. If the sender has no more data, it indicates this before the transmission of the last byte. This happens via a timing side channel. As soon as all receivers have signaled that they can now receive a byte, the sender delays the next step in the protocol by at least 200 microseconds, the so-called EOI delay. For confirmation, all receivers then pull the data line to zero. This is the EOI ACK. Each device can be a sender, and each can be a receiver. There needs to be an allocation of who sends data at any given time and for whom it is intended. Just like with IEEE 488, there's a dedicated controller on the bus, the computer, and everything else is devices. The controller is the only one that is allowed to pull the attention line, ATN. Uh, this allows it to transmit command codes that are received by all devices. During normal data transmission, as well as when the bus is idle, ATN is zero. The controller can pull ATN at any time and also pulls clock at the same time. And within a thousand microseconds, all devices must pull the data line. This is now the exact state of the start of a byte transmission. The sender, the controller in this case, holds clock, and the receivers, all devices, hold data. The byte is now sent by the controller. Afterwards, it releases ATN. All devices have now received the command code. Level three of the protocol stack, the talk listen level, defines what these codes mean. To indicate which device the command is meant for, the device's address is encoded into the command. Commodore's convention for these numbers is 4 and 5 for printers, 6 and 7 for plotters, and 8 through 30 for disk drives. The 1541.2 has dip switches to select addresses 8 through 11. The original 1541, uh, you'd have to cut a solder bridge to switch it from 8 to 9. Device numbers 0 through 3 are legal but uncommon because they would collide with other devices in the C64's firmware. The controller itself has no device number because this is uh, the one who addresses all other devices. And these are the command codes. Listen switch is a device to listening. The device number is added to the code. Hex is 20. Unlisten disables all listeners. Talk switch is a device to listening. And untalk disables all talkers. By transmitting a uh, secondary address, we can select one of multiple functions or channels of a device. And open and close can associate channels with strings. Let's look at this in detail. The controller pulls the ATN line. All devices receive the command code, which the controller sends now. The code 24 means listen for device 4. And after the ATN line is released again, device 4 is a listener. Now the controller can send data over the bus, and it will be received by this single listener. The controller then pulls ATN again and sends the command byte 3F, unlisten. It is received again by all devices, and the printer stops being a listener. If we send a secondary address after the listen command, this tells the, the device that the talk or listen should go to a specific channel or function of the device. For printers, for example, the secondary address selects the character set. For floppy drives, it usually selects an open file. This example sends talk to device 8 plus a secondary address of hex F, which is 15. The device is now a talker. We can receive data from it. And at the end, we send untalk. The controller doesn't even have to be involved in the data transmission. For example, we can make device 4 the listener and device 8 channel 15 the talker. The devices then talk directly to each other. Open and close are command codes by, um, added by Commodore that did not exist in the original IEEE 488 standard. They allow channels to be identified by a string. The example here, uh, listen 8, open channel 1, associating it with the string foo and unlisten. After listen 8, channel 1, we send hello into this named channel um, and then finish with unlisten. Finally, we dissociate the channel uh, 1 from this name, so listen 8, close 1, unlisten. This is how files are addressed on a disk, and it's actually already layer 4 Commodore DOS.
On the Commodore DOS layer, the meaning of the string passed when opening a named channel depends, of, depends on the channel number. Channels 2 to 14 are always associated with files. The open string consists of the file name, followed by two comma separated arguments, the file type, and the access mode read-write append. Channels 0 and 1 are also meant for files. They are shortcuts for reading and writing PRG type files, so the type and mode arguments don't have to be added to the file name. Channel 0 supports a special case. If we open the file with the name dollar, the drive sends the disk's directory listing. The format is the same as that of Commodore basic programs. The file sizes in the first column are basic line numbers. This makes it possible to load the directory with the load dollar comma 8, just like a basic program, and display it with list. On channel, um, channel 15 is used for sending commands to the drive as well as reading the drive status. The status is a string consisting of four comma-separated components, the error code, the message, the track, and the sector. The first digit of the code indicates the error type. Codes beginning, beginning with zero and one are not errors. If we write to channel 15, the string is evaluated as a DOS command. The 1541 understands 18 commands. Here are some of them. This command, as S is in scratch, deletes all files beginning with foo, as well as the file bar. R as in rename, renames a file. C as in copy, makes a copy of a file. And N as in new, formats a disk. The two characters after the comma are the disk ID that will be written into each sector header. The command API also allows us to upload custom code into the 1541's RAM. MW, memory write, writes data to RAM. The command is followed by the binary coded 16-bit address, the number of bytes, and the data. With m-e, memory execute, we can make the 1541 execute code in its memory. The command is followed by the address in binary code. And we're already in the territory of hacking. Let's first look at how we can increase the speed of the 1541 by uploading our own code to replace some of the ROM's functions. Without a fast loader, the reach speed of the 1541 is just 400 bytes per second. But there's potential. With a good fast loader, we can go up to seven and a half kilobytes per second. Reading the data of a sector alone always takes only exactly as long as it takes for the sector to pass the read head. So at five revolutions per second and about 20 seconds per track, just reading the bits takes about a hundredth of a second. GCR decoding and the transmission to the C64 take multiples of this. The greatest potential for optimizing is in the transmission. We saw earlier that each bit must be held for 60 microseconds with clock released. That's the time window for the receiver to, to read the bit. And between bits, clock must be held for 60 microseconds. If either of these windows were too small for the receiver, a bit could be missed. 2 times 8 times 60 microseconds equals 960 microseconds. So this protocol will manage at most 1 kilobyte per second. But why does it have to be 60 microseconds? And why do we transmit a bit on every rising edge instead of every edge? The answer to the second question lies in the byte transfer protocol as it was originally designed for the hardware shift register of the VIC-20. The VIIO controllers in the computer and in the drive contain a shift register that can transfer data serially with a hold time of only one microsecond, one bit on each rising edge without using the CPU at all. But the 6522 VIA had a design flaw, so the shift register didn't work reliably. It wasn't until the C128 and the 1571 drive that this was fixed. For the devices in between, the whole time was simply increased so that the protocol could be driven in software. On the VIC-20, the CPU managed to speak the protocol with a whole time of 20 microseconds. But for the 64, it was even more complicated. The VIC-2 video chip stops the CPU for 40 clocks once every eight visible screen lines because it needs exclusive access to the shared RAM. These are the so-called bad lines. So timing-critical timing software has to deal with the fact that the CPU can be paused for 40 microseconds at practically any time. They therefore increase the whole time from 20 microseconds to 60 microseconds, adding these 40 microseconds. Here's one way to do it differently. Between the bad lines, we always have 400 microseconds in which we can transmit completely undisturbed. We only have to pause just before each bad line. And in the border and vertical blanking area, we have another 7,000 microseconds of undisturbed time. So about 80% of the time is left for the transmission. Alternatively, we can disable all screen output completely um, during loading, so the CPU remains undisturbed at all times. With uh, 1 MHz 1541 and an undisturbed C64, which also runs at about 1 MHz, we can get the whole time of 60 microseconds back down to 20 microseconds. One byte will then meet, need 320 microseconds. But this way, the protocol still unnecessarily only sends bits on the rising edge. If we send on both edges, we just need 160 microseconds for each byte. But 
if the code at the sender puts the new value on the line exactly every 20 microseconds and the receiver reads the value exactly every 20 microseconds, we don't need the clock line at all. Then we can simply use both lines for data bits and the transmission only takes half as long again. And because all the receiver ha now has to do is read the bits from the port instead of waiting for a clock and then reading, we can reduce the whole time of 20 microseconds to just eight. One byte now needs only 32 microseconds, down from almost, almost 1,000. In practice, it can take twice as long, though. This is some real-world code. The code on the left runs on the 1541 and sends data. The code on the right is the receiving code on the C64. The actual transmission of the byte is this part. The 1541 always writes two bits at a time to the I.O. port and then prepares the next two bits. The C64 always... Uh, reads two bits at the same time and shifts them into the right place. But we also need some code for the loop to transmit multiple bytes, as well as some code to fetch and store the data. Then some code for the sender and receiver to synchronize after each byte. And if the screen is on, the C64 has to check before each byte if a bad line is imminent. But with some compromises, we can get it faster. With the screen off, we, don't, we no longer need bad line detection. As long as we don't run out of memory, we can unroll the loop. And, but it makes the biggest difference if the sender and receiver don't synchronize after each byte. But we have to be careful. The C64 and the 1541 run at slightly different clock speeds. After 68 clocks, with, which corresponds to one or two transmitted bytes, there's an offset of one clock cycle. So after every few bytes, either the 1541 has to delay for a few clocks or the two devices have to resynchronize. With tricks like these, which, by the way, were already known a few years after the introduction of the C64, we get the transfer of a sector down from about 250 milliseconds to just 20 milliseconds, which is the time it takes for two sectors to pass the head. Now we can look into speeding up the decoding. And indeed, we can get this time down to zero. In fact, it is possible to decode GCR on the fly while reading, that is, within 26 clocks per incoming byte. It took over 30 years, though, until someone managed to develop code that could do this. Linus Ockerson, also known as LFT, found the holy grail of 1541 programming in 2013. With GCR encoded data, we always have to look at a sequence of five bytes. These contain eight GCR5 tuples, which must be converted into four-bit tuples according to the table. Some of these are contained completely within one input byte. We only need to mask and shift the bytes and then look them up in the table. It is more difficult with those five tuples that extend over two bytes. Shifting these is complex and slow. The trick with these is to fold the bytes into one after masking, so the bottom part is shifted into the top. All bits are still preserved, just in a different order. We just, ha just has to have to adjust the translation table so that this bit combination is translated correctly. The same trick can be applied to all other five tuples that span byte boundaries. Um, adding the simple cases without shifting, and we have extracted unique input values for all, eight tup uh, for all those eight tuples that have to be looked up without having to shift. We would need eight tables, one for each of these eight lines, but because of the redundancy in the codes due to the many zeros, it is possible to combine all, these, all this into two tables. These two tables can be created quite easily at runtime. To hit the 26 cycle deadline, the implementation also uses tricks like self-modification and undocumented 6502 opcodes. And to speed up storing the data, the bytes are simply put on the stack. This is the complete code. Green, the green label marks the entry point. Blue marks the instructions that each read one byte from the header. And red marks the places where a decoded byte is written onto the stack. With fast transfer routines and GCR on the fly, a block can be read and transferred so that only the next two blocks need to be skipped. So that's an interleave of three and equals to about 30 blocks per second or seven and a half kilobytes per second. This was some insight into what we can do to speed up reading or writing if we upload our own code. But with our own code, you can also use a modified storage format on disk or even a completely new one. As discussed earlier, the 1541's firmware only uses 35 tracks, although media and mechanism would support 40 tracks. With little effort, we can reuse the code in the 1541 ROM to support the additional tracks as well. We would use the lowest density with 17 sectors per track. This results in 85 additional blocks, so the capacity of the disk increases from 170 to 192 kilobytes. Track 41 is out of spec, but most mechanics can reach it. Uh, this would then result in eight, uh, 785 blocks or 196 kilobytes. But is it safe to write the upper tracks at the same density as tracks 31 through 35? Actually, the number of bytes per millimeter exceeds the specification slightly. In practice, however, it seems to be safe. After all, Commodore also made 500 quarter uh, inch drives that wrote 500 
kilobytes on the very same 48 TPI media. Custom formats can have more than just the goal of storing more data. The Epic's Vorpal system and its clones, Warp 25, uh, Turbo 25, and Eureka Sprint, store data slightly less densely, thereby increasing load speed. Vorpal manages to transfer a block with an interleave of two, meaning a block is read and transmitted with a duration of just two sectors. It uses regular sync marks, headers, and gaps, but uses an alternate GCR encoding in this sector data. This allows only 192 bytes to be stored per sector. This GCR scheme is already half pre-decoded during reading and fully decoded uh, during transmission. And since it's just 192 bytes that have to be transferred, the complete processing fits into the duration of two sectors. User-defined storage formats go hand in hand with copy protection techniques. If the copy program cannot read the disk, it cannot copy it. And some formats are even truly uncopyable. There are basically three classes of copy protection mechanisms. Those that confuse or overwhelm existing copy programs, but with basically nothing to prevent reading the data and reproducing it on another disk. The second class is based on the fact that some forms of data on floppy disks cannot be read or written correctly because of the limitations of the 1541, but with an additional parallel cable between the drive and the C64, such disks can be copied. And the third class are disks that are impossible to duplicate using a 1541 without invasive modifications. Let's start with the simple mechanisms. A killer track is a track consisting of only one bits, that is, a continuous sync signal. After a sync, the ROM code waits without any timeout for the first data byte, which will never arrive, so the code is stuck in an infinite loop. The copy protected program doesn't even have to test if the current disk is authentic. The idea is that the user won't even succeed at making a copy because the copy program will hang. Another quite low-level um, trick is intentional read errors. The drive ROM knows six different types of read errors, which can be created very easily. Simple copy programs will often skip the bad sectors when copying, so the protected program only needs to test if the particular error exists on disk. Some older copy programs may also only copy regular tracks, 1 to 35, so some copy protected programs use the additional tracks, sometimes only for signatures, but often also to store data. After all, this way they get 85 additional blocks or so. Another trick is to write some tracks with a different density than specified, or even have the density vary within a track. Copy programs usually use a hard-coded density table, so they may completely fail at reading these tracks. In the previous visualizations, we saw sector zero of all tracks always aligned at the same position, but that was a simplification. On a real disk, the tracks are all independent of each other and are usually shifted arbitrarily. A copy protection scheme can take advantage of this by creating a mask disk so that the tracks are aligned in a defined way. The program then reads a sector, changes the track, and immediately reads the next sector. On a copy, this will most likely be a different sector than the expected one. All these mechanisms so far can be defeated by a copy program that is aware of these tricks. In the last case, for example, it must also extract the track offset from the source disk and write all tracks correctly aligned to the target disk. But there's also a whole class of tricks that take advantage of the 1541's weaknesses. It's generally impossible to read a complete track at once with an unmodified 1541. A track consists of up to 8 kilobytes of raw data, but the 1541 only has 2 kilobytes of memory, so only 6 sectors fit into RAM at once when reading the raw data. It is also impossible to transmit the raw data into the C64 on the fly. The C64 would have enough memory, but in zone three, a byte arrives from the head every 26 clocks, and transmitting a byte needs at least 38 clocks, even under optimal conditions. All this can be used for copy protection. This is a single overlong sector with more than two kilobytes of GCR code. To read it, we need multiple passes. We first fill all of RAM in the first pass. And in the second pass, we have to pick up from where we left off before. But without a well-known disk structure, how can we find the exact location again in the, next, in the next revolution? It gets even worse with tracks that contain a single sync mark. Such tracks are hard to use for data, so they're usually just for signatures, and often in tracks 36 to 41. Again, a copy program that cannot read the track in one go has no clue where to restart. A particularly creative copy uh, protection mechanism was used by the Geo's graphical user interface. It stores a magic signature in the gaps after the header and after the sector data that cannot be reduced, uh, reproduced by um, an unmodified 1541. Any disk copy program must write a track to the destination disk in two steps. First, it formats the track, writing the sinks, headers, and empty sectors in the correct format. Now that all, all markers are on the track, it can then write single sectors one at a time. <laughs> 
during formatting, it would be possible to write the correct signature into the gaps, but when the sector's actual contents are written later, either the signature in the front gap or in the back gap is destroyed because the 1541 can, uh, cannot write the new data at a bit exact location. Let's look at this in detail. This is the header gap with a sync marker after it. Geos expects the signature 5555567 here. If the new data is written a little too late, the signature remains intact, but if, the, if it is written a little too early, the signature is destroyed. It works the same way on the other end. If we write something beyond the end, the first bits of the signature are missing and completely different values will be read later. If we write the new data a bit too early, bits of the old sector data remain, which become part of the gap and also falsify the signature. But all these copy protection schemes can be defeated by adding an 8-bit parallel port to the 1541, which is fast enough to transfer a track to the C64 on the fly. The next class of mechanisms requires far more invasive hardware interventions or even special devices. A fat track consists of two or more tracks that contain the same data, as if there were a single extra wide track. The principle is similar to sector offsets, except that here the protected program can move the head to the neighboring track in the middle of reading data and still read the correct data. Special hardware is required to create such disks. Overlong tracks are tracks that are recorded at a higher density than the 1541 is capable of. The highest density is one bit every 3.25 microseconds. To record at a higher density, a 1541 with a modified motor speed is used. If we run the disk at, say, 275 RPM instead of 300, the bits are written 8% more densely. When reading in a normal drive, the bits arrive every three microseconds. A 1541 can reach such data without problems, but cannot fit the 8% of additional data on the target disk. Now, how do we, nowadays, manage to read 1541 disks correctly? What kinds of tools are there, and what do you have to pay attention to if you want to preserve your old floppy disk collection for eternity? One possibility is to connect peripherals to an existing C64 setup that can write to SD cards or USB sticks. Solutions like the 1541 Ultimate 2, the Turbo Chameleon cartridge, um, as well as the IT, uh, SD to IC adapter allow you to read floppy disks to D64 images. D64 is a file format in which all 683 sectors of a regular 1541 disk are stored one after another, without headers, just with the 256 bytes of user data per sector. This does not work with copy-protected disks or special formats, and is not recommended for disks with errors. You can, however, connect a 1541 directly to a modern computer. Adapt adapters like the Zoom 1541 or Zoom Floppy have a Commodore serial connector on the one side and USB on the other. With such a setup, you can read floppies into G64 format as long as you either have a 1541 connected with a parallel cable or if you use a 1571. G64 files store the raw bit patterns of the track. Here we can directly see the sync marks, the headers, the data, and the gaps. G64 can therefore store almost all copy protection mechanisms, and for disks with errors, it stores all bits as they were read, so you can analyze them later and perhaps even reconstruct the data from bad disks. Or you can connect a generic PC drive to a modern computer. Devices like Cryoflux and Supercard Pro interface the drive mechanism to USB. The data is dumped at the magnetic flux level and decoded completely in software, which allows this setup to also read Apple or PC disks, for example. For hopeless causes of disks, you can go even lower. There's a whole talk dedicated to recovering from, um, data from bad floppy disks using much lower level methods by Chris Evans later today in this room. My preferred method is zoom flop, the zoom floppy adapter with a 1571 or a parallel 1541 because the associated nib tools are optimized for the 1541 use case. Nib read reads all tracks one by one and detects the recording speed and how many raw data bytes there are on, on the track. It also tests the extra tracks. Weak GCR is harmless, but let's look at where this comes from. For this, let's look at another way of visualizing a disk. Each section here is a track. Each pixel line is a sector. On the left is the header followed by the gap, and on the right is the sector data. This is a freshly formatted disk, which is why everything looks so orderly. Now, if you read the same disk multiple times, there may be bits that cannot be read reliably and look different each time. The, there are weak bits at the end of the header gap here. As we've seen before, when the sector content is written, the last bits of the gap are often affected, and often in a way that the magnetization of the transition cannot be unambiguously translated into zeros and ones. Such weak bits in the gaps are harmless, at least in regular disk formats. However, weak bits can also occur in the data. Um, here are examples where the data twitches when read multiple times. If we look at a single sector here, we can see that there are four different spots where sometimes an extra bit is detected. Since both the sector header and the data have an 8-bit checksum, such sectors can often be recovered by repeated reading. <laughs> 
Another error that is often encountered is missing headers or data blocks. Um, this, this happens when the sync mark is no longer recognized. But since the actual data is usually intact, it's often possible to reconstruct such sectors. This image shows a dropout. At a certain point, only zeros are read, so no magnetic flux. The next sector in the pixel line below is missing completely because the sync mark was not found. This can be due to a demagnetized disk, but a much more likely reason is dirt. If you read the disk several times, you will often see something like this. The errors get fewer with each read until the pattern stabilizes. The dirt has simply been rubbed off. This is why it's important to set a high number of retries when reading. If the errors do not go away, you can use alcohol wipes to clean the surface. This can be done quite well by clamping a wipe like this and reading the disk once completely, so that all tracks are reached. Just remember that this cleans the reverse side of the one that you're currently reading. Sometimes you get messages like this while reading. Track 9 here shows completely different errors at each attempt. This cannot be because of the medium. It is because of the drive. The coating of the disk can rub off at the head and look like this. With alcohol and a cotton swab, you can clean it very easily. So if you still have boxes of floppy disks lying around, you should preserve them. There might still be some of your old self-written programs on them. And if you don't have the setup or confidence to copy them yourself, you will surely find someone to help you. The C64 scene is alive. That's all I could fit into 51 and a half minutes. If you want to know more, there are several classic books on the topic, all of which you can find online. And of course, there's my blog, pagetable.com, which is also available as a Twitter feed. I write lots of articles about retro topics, especially the C64. Most of this talk is based on articles from my blog. Thank you very much for your attention, and see you next time.